Hello, everyone. Welcome to Brookhaven Online. Come on, let's take a few minutes and declare the goodness of God together. Let's sing some songs of worship and remind ourselves of who he is. All my life you have been so, 
so good with every breath that I am able. Oh, I will sing of the goodness of God. Yes, I will sing of the goodness of God. Your goodness never stops, keeps running after me. I can live in faith and confidence, knowing you are for me. Yeah. Cause I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child. God, and I'm no longer a slave to fear, I am a child of God, just comfort yourself with these words, I'm no longer a slave to fear, oh I know I am a child of God, I'm free Lord. I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. Oh, 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 oh. your love eradicates all fear in our lives fear is right there beside us waiting for us to give in God but we know that when we trust in you and we keep our eyes on you 
We don't have to give in to that fear. We pray for peace today for everyone who's watching this and for everyone who's worshiping with us. God, just peace in their hearts. God, help us to trust in you, to hold on to you. You're our foundation. You're our joy. You're our peace. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Nathan Otwell. We are so appreciative of Nathan, such a good friend of our church, leading us to um, in worship and focusing our hearts upon the Lord Jesus this morning. So welcome to the online service of Brookhaven Church. I'm Glenn Meredith. I'm the pastor of our church, and I'm so grateful for all of you who have uh, joined us today online. And uh, this is hard to believe. This is our fourth week that we've been uh, bringing services to you online that we've not been able to gather up together. And, um, but in spite of that, I just want to tell you that the church is doing really well. Uh, it's alive and well and ministering to its people. Our small groups are uh, meeting online uh, through the Zoom app, and we're calling each other and keeping up with each other and having meetings and talking and, and uh, meeting needs. And so things are going really well at the church. And so although we can't meet together, uh, we are still praying, we are working, we're ministering, and, uh, and God is being glorified. So thank you for all that you're doing to help our church continue to be a light uh, in this darkness and this world in which we're in. And so um, it's hard to believe that next Sunday is Easter Sunday, and really for the first time, and probably that any of us could ever remember, our church will not be able to gather together on Easter Sunday. And yet, it's important for us to remember as God's children that we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus every Sunday. And so next Sunday will be no different. We will be celebrating the glorious resurrection of Jesus. And even though we'll be doing it like this uh, through technology and online, uh, we're going re- to celebrate his resurrection. Jesus is Lord and he is victorious. I do want to ask you, however, that you would put a little thought into how you might could make uh, Easter Sunday special there in your home next week. And um, we'll be doing something to try to uh, online, try to uh, make it a special day, but we are somewhat limited in what we can do, as you might would imagine. But I want to ask you to put some thought and some planning into what could you do with your family that could really make it a special day. And it just might be that in years from now that your kids, children might look back and say, that's the best Easter Sunday that we ever had. So, uh, so pray to that end and prepare uh, to that end. All this week, starting today and all this week, I'm going to be speaking to you on the cross, the glory of the cross. It is in the cross of our Lord Jesus that God reveals so much uh, to us of what he is like. I want to be speaking to you about that today. But actually, I'm going to continue that each morning this week. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, I began a little two-minute Uh, video each morning we call Two Minutes of Encouragement, where we uh, try to start our day off together just focusing on God, focusing on His truth. And so I email that out to our people. I send it uh, via text messaging uh, to our people, and you'll have the video right there on your phone to start the day. If you are not uh, receiving those videos and you would like to, then we will put the information up on the screen at the end of the message today so that you can uh, get signed up and then you can join us each morning this week as I talk about each morning in our two minutes of encouragement about what God reveals to us about himself through the cross. So I hope that you'll join me and that you'll participate with us as we lead up to next Sunday's glorious resurrection of Jesus celebration. So uh, I look forward to uh, sharing with you all through the week. But today, I want to talk to you about the glory of the cross and what God reveals to us about himself through the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. You see, God is so incredibly amazing that that really we, we can't really understand God. I know that you would join me in saying that there are times that you just really scratch your head and wonder what is God doing. There are probably times in your life when you're confused and and you're going, God, I don't know why you're doing this or why you're not doing that or why is it that God seems to answer prayer sometimes and then sometimes he doesn't answer and and why he gets involved in certain situations just so 
uh, blatantly and so obviously. And then other times it just seems like that uh, you, you can't see God at work. And so we're, we're often confused and we don't understand the ways of God. Yet that shouldn't really surprise us. God himself says in his word, he says in Isaiah chapter 55, in verse eight and nine, he says, my thoughts are not your thoughts and my ways are not your ways. As high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is, are my ways above your ways and my thoughts above your thoughts. God says, I just am operating on a whole different level than you are. And so the fact that, that you and I can't always understand and figure out what God's doing should not surprise us. Sometimes God is at work in our lives right now doing something that makes no sense to us right now that may be setting up something that he's got planned for you 15 years from now. So of course it doesn't make sense right now, but it will make a lot of sense down the road. And so we have to learn to trust God when we can't quite figure out what he is doing. So God is so much greater than us. With our little brains, we cannot logically figure out God. But God wants us to know him, and he wants us to know what he's like. And so God has revealed himself to us. When God reveals himself, it is God being glorified. The glory of God is really the sum of all of God's attributes. It is what he is like. It is the sum total of what he is like. And so when God reveals something of what he is like, then God has been glorified. You remember the story of where Moses just flat out asked God in Exodus chapter 33, he says, God, show me your glory. And God says, okay, I'm gonna cause my goodness to pass by you and that I will proclaim to you my name. God's name stands for his person, what he is like. He said, I'm going to proclaim it to you. I'm going to tell you what I am like, and I'm going to show you my goodness. And so his glory is him showing his goodness, showing and proclaiming what he is like. Now today, we're going to look at a passage of scripture that's found in the gospel of John, beginning in verse 23, where Jesus says, the time has come, the hour has come for me to be glorified, for God to reveal something. So join me in reading in the Gospel of John, chapter 12. If you'd like to, you can join me by looking on the screen in verse 23. It says, Jesus replied, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Very truly, I tell you, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. Now my soul is troubled. In verse 27, what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour? No, it was for this very reason that I came to this hour, that I came to this earth. Father, glorify your name. And then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it and I will glorify it again. Skipping to verse 31. Now is the time for judgment on this world. Now the prince of this world will be driven out, and I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. He said this to show the kind of death he was going to die. Now back in verse 23, Jesus says, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Now what he meant by that was something totally different than what all those around him had in mind. In fact, if you were to go back and read just a few verses before this and get the context of what's going on here, this is probably the absolute last thing that they expected Jesus to say. If you remember, Jesus had just a short time prior to this, he had healed uh, Lazarus, or actually raised Lazarus from the dead in chapter 11. And when he raised Lazarus from the dead, there were all kinds of Jewish people that had gathered there and they saw that. And I mean, all of a sudden, Lazarus became like a, a celebrity. And Jesus, of course, was a celebrity. And man, their fame of both of them were spreading throughout Jerusalem in the, in the area. 
So now chapter 12 begins with saying that Jesus had arrived at Bethany. It's six days before the Passover. This Passover is where he's going to die. So six days prior to that, he arrives at the home of, of, I guess, Lazarus and Mary and Martha. And a dinner is being uh, given in Jesus's honor because of what he's done for Lazarus and raising him from the dead. The Bible tells us that many people had heard that Jesus had arrived. They started gathering up, not just to see Jesus. They wanted to see Lazarus too, because they've heard this guy has been raised from the dead. And so then a short time later, Jesus begins to head toward Jerusalem. Now, the Bible tells us that word about Jesus and what he had done had been spreading everywhere. Now the city was beginning to fill up with all kinds of people from all over the world as they were gathering for the Passover celebration. Hundreds of thousands of people were gathering and it was a a busy time. And it was like there was this expectation and they were all hearing about this miracle and they're hearing about Jesus. And now they hear that Jesus is starting toward Jerusalem and the people begin to run out into the streets and lining the highways and Jesus begins to ride into Jerusalem on a donkey. And you remember the story how the people grab palm branches and begin to wave the palm branches and they begin to shout, Hosanna, Hosanna, Lord, save. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, the King of Israel. And so they're shouting, Hosanna, Lord, save. And they're just, it's like electricity in the air. Even as enemies, the the religious leaders begin to say, the whole world is going after him. Now, you and I don't so easily capture the significance of the palm branches. What had happened was literally about 174 years before this date, the Jewish people had been conquered by the Greeks, by a guy named Antigas Epiphanes. And Antigas was a a vicious guy and he had actually gone into Jerusalem He had conquered Jerusalem. He had desecrated the temple. He had actually set up a statue of Zeus there in the the temple, and he had slaughtered a pig on the altar and desecrated the altar. And it was a a type or a foreshadowing of what the Antichrist is going to do one day and what is called the abomination of desolation, desecrating the holy place of the temple there in Jerusalem. So Antiochus Epiphanes does this, and he leaves a a garrison of troops there in Jerusalem to to, um, oppress the people and to to rule over them. And so for many years, the Jewish people were interrupted in their ability to worship God and their sacrificial system and so many things were going on. And so it was during that time that a family by the name of the Maccabees uh, was raised up And one of those guys, Simon Maccabees, in 141 BC, he went into Jerusalem and he defeated the Greek garrison there and he liberated the city and he reconsecrated the temple, cleansed the altar, and they were able to start their worship of God again. And when that happened, this guy was sort of like a Messiah figure. He had helped throw off the Greek oppression. And when that happened, they grabbed palm branches and they began to wave them and they began to shout and sing and sing praises to God and worship the Lord. And so from that point on in Israel's history over the last 174 years, the sign of the palm branches was sort of like um, national is, is Israeli nationalism. It was almost like us grabbing the American flag and waving it in in show of patriotism. So when Jesus comes riding into Jerusalem on that Palm Sunday and they grab these palm branches and they're shouting, they're not thinking of Jesus as the savior of the world spiritually. They're thinking Jesus is going to come and be their political Messiah. He's coming as their military leader. He's going to come as the king of Israel and he's going to throw the Romans off their neck and he is going to be the king of Israel and set up the kingdom. And so there's this expectation that the Messiah has arrived and they are excited about what he's about to do. 
And now the first thing that he does, as soon as this triumphal entry is over, Jesus sits down and he says, now the time has come. The hour has come for the son of man to be glorified. And I would suspect that the people standing around thought he was about to say, let the revolution begin. He was, they were expecting him to, to blow the trumpet or something, muster the troops. But instead he begins to say, I'm going to die. Now is the time for the Son of Man, the hour has come for him to be glorified. Well, we would have thought that him being glorified is what just happened out on the road and everybody's shouting Hosanna. But Jesus says, now I'm about, the, to- the hour has come for me to be glorified and starts talking about his death. Now, I don't really think the people around his disciples or the others around understood maybe a whole lot of what was happening. I don't think they understood what he was talking about, but I'm sure they couldn't have been more surprised and more shocked. The hour had come. It's interesting to me that Jesus uses that terminology, the hour, the time has come. There have been so many times in his ministry up to this point when Jesus pointed out and the Bible points out that it wasn't the time. For example, when he first started his ministry, you remember he did his first miracle at a wedding at Cana of Galilee and his mother uh, uh, tells the, the servants there to listen to Jesus because the, the, the celebration, they had run out of wine. And so you remember that she said, just do whatever he says. And Jesus responds to Mary and he says, woman, why do you involve me? My hour has not yet come. It was sometime later in John chapter 7, it's recorded that Jesus is teaching and and, uh, some of what he has said has offended some of the people around there. And it says, at this, at what he had said, they tried to seize him, but no one laid a hand on him because his hour had not yet come. The next chapter, in chapter 8, same thing again. He's teaching in the temple courts. It says, He spoke these words while teaching in the temple courts near the place where the offerings were put. Yet no one seized him because his hour had not yet come. There were other times that, that they would pick up stones to stone Jesus and he would just turn and walk back through them because his hour had not yet come. There was a time in Nazareth when they took him to the brow of the hill and they were going to throw him off the cliff, but he just turned and walked back through the crowd because his hour had not yet come. Now here's what I want you to see. God had a purpose and plan for Jesus to to come. Jesus had said, the hour has come. And then he says in verse 27 in John 12, he said, what should I say? Father, deliver me from this hour. And And then he says, no, it was for this very reason that I came. You see, God had a purpose and a plan for Jesus. And God was in control of all the circumstances that were surrounding that to bring about that plan. And God had a perfect timing and God was right on schedule. So now Jesus says in John chapter 12, all this time, my hour has not come, but now we get to John 12, right after the triumphal entry, and he says, the time, the hour has come for me to be glorified. Well, he goes with his disciples into the upper room and in chapter 13, it says, it was before the Passover festival, Jesus knew that the hour had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. The hour had come. In, verse, in chapter 17, he's praying to his father the night he's betrayed. And after this, Jesus looked toward heaven and he prayed, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son that your son may glorify you. So what I'm trying to show you is that God had a purpose and plan. That God had a timing. And that all the circumstances that were raging around them, this was not... Jesus' death was not some uh, result of a mob being out of control. It wasn't just a bad thing happening to a good person. It wasn't just this injustice because we live in 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 an evil fallen world and just bad things happen. This was under the control of God. God had a plan. God was in control of the circumstances 
and God had a perfect timing. In fact, Peter on the day of Pentecost stands up and in his sermon on the day of Pentecost in chapter two, verse 22, he says, fellow Israelites, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did among you through him, as you yourself know. This man was handed over to you by God's deliberate plan and foreknowledge, and you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. So Peter says, this was not some gigantic accident. This was by the plan and foreknowledge of God. And so everybody's crying for his death. The mob's out of control. The religious leaders are plotting as best they can. They're doing their mock trials, their false witnesses. All of that is happening, but God is in control of it all. God has a plan. He is in control of the circumstances and he is right on time. So we learn through the cross of Jesus about the sovereignty of God. We learn that God is always in control, that God is never playing catch up, where God is never caught by surprise, God is never stressed out, God is never scratching his head wondering what he's gonna do next, God is never having to check his bank account to see if he's got enough money to cover your needs, God is in total control. God has a plan for your life and he's right on time. And I know it may not seem like God is, is active in your life right now. It may not see, you may not be able to tell what he's doing. Maybe you can't figure him out and maybe you seem confused. And maybe God's ways are so much higher than your ways that you just really can't quite put what he's doing in perspective. But he wants you to know and he demonstrates through the cross that he has a plan, that he is in total control of the circumstances. Even the bad things that are happening around your life and in our world right now, God is in control of all of that and it is not going to stop him from accomplishing his purposes in your life if you will trust him. And God is right on schedule. His timing is always perfect. So God has a plan. He is in control of your circumstances and he's right on time. And he wants you today to trust him. He wants you to know that you can put your life completely in his hands and he is going to take care of you and he's going to use you if you'll trust him. Maybe you're listening to me today and maybe you've never made a decision to commit your life to Jesus and ask him to be your Lord and your savior. You know, Jesus said in the passage we started with, he said, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto myself. And he was by that signifying the kind of death he was going to die. He was going to die on the cross so that he might draw me and he might draw you to himself. Do you know that the Bible tells us that we never, no, no man seeks after God. It says, there is none righteous, no, not one. There's no one who seeks after God. Left to ourselves, we wouldn't even think about God. We, wouldn't, we don't care anything about serving God. And so the Bible says we don't seek after God. So if all of a sudden there starts arising in our hearts and our minds thoughts about God, if all of a sudden you start feeling this, this pull and this tug that I need to, to get right with God and I need a relationship with God, then that is God drawing you. That is the Lord Jesus doing for you what he said he was going to do, draw you to himself. He made a promise in Revelation 3.20. He said, I stand at the door and I knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him. I will fellowship with him and he with me. So Jesus said, your life is like a, a, a house with a door on it. And he says, I'm knocking. Do you hear my voice? What's his voice sound like? His voice is that pull, that tug, that sense of oughtness that you feel that I ought to make this decision for Jesus. I ought to get right with God. That's his voice. That's him inviting you. That's him drawing you. He says, do you hear that? If you do, then he says, open the door and I will come in. 
He didn't say, I might come in. He didn't say, maybe I'll come in. He said, if you open the door of your life, I will come in. So how do you open the door? You just ask him. If I came to your house today and I knocked on your door, if you were going to get me to come inside, you could just say, door's open. Or you could just look through the window and just motion for me to come in. All I would have to do is just hear from you an indication that you want me to come in. That's all Jesus is waiting on today. He died on that cross for you. He died there to pay for your sins. He died so you could be forgiven, so that you could have a relationship with God, and he's ready to be your savior today. He's just waiting for you to invite him to come in. If you'd like to do that, you can do that right now. You can just pray a prayer like this. Lord Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner and I know that I cannot do anything to deserve to be made right with God. But I believe you died on the cross for me and I'm asking you to come into my life Save me from my sins and make me your child. And from this day forward, I will follow you with my life. If you'd pray a prayer like that, it's not a magic prayer. It's just a prayer that if that expresses that you really want him to come in, he says, he promises, you open the door, I will come in. If you just prayed that prayer with me, would you let me know that by just writing to our church office? You can write rachel at brookhavenchurch.com and just say, I prayed that prayer with the pastor last Sunday. If you'll do that, I would love to contact you this week. Leave us your contact information and I would love to just contact you and talk to you about what you do now that you've given your life to Jesus. That'd be a, a privilege to talk to you. I hope you'll do that. If you're a child of God listening to me today, I just want to encourage you and remind you that in spite of all of the circumstances around us that seem to be spinning out of control, I just want to remind you that God has a plan for your life. God is in total control. And just like Jesus was indestructible until that time came for his, the hour came for him to be glorified. So you are indestructible until God's finished with you in this world. He has a plan, he is in total control, and his timing is perfect. So trust him today. Put your life completely in his hands and let him lead you, guide you, provide and protect you, use you, and fill you with his peace. I'm so grateful that you've tuned in today. I want to ask you to do a couple of more things for me. If you would like to... Um, Sign up for the two minutes of encouragement that we do every, every morning, Monday through Friday. Then if you'll just look at the information on the screen, just write us, email us, let us know that you want to be on the, the list and we will get you signed up this week and you'll receive an email, text message or both with a link to the video. Join us as we continue to look this week at the glory of the cross, what God reveals to us about himself through the cross. One last thing. You have been so faithful as God's people to support our church financially over these last number of weeks. You know, we normally, uh, the vast majority of the offerings that come in usually are done as we are in our worship services together and we pass our offering buckets. We haven't been able to do that now for a month. But you have faithfully gone online and you have given and, uh, and you have sent your checks in the mail and I just want to tell you, I appreciate that. And you have been very faithful and God is providing for the needs of the church. I want to ask you as much as you can do so, continue to be faithful in doing that and sending your gifts. So you can go online today and you can give online. We'll get it immediately. Or you can write the church, 6101 Stacy Road in McKinney, Texas, 75070. And just write and send that and we will get it in the bank this week. We would really appreciate that. And so until tomorrow, we will begin our study of the glory of the cross all through the week. And so we look forward to meeting with you again next Sunday as we celebrate the glorious, victorious resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. So God bless you. Have a great week.